The Klaus Auk has concluded. Xenoblade 1, 2, and 3 have come and gone, but the future awaits, and Xenoblade has been exploding in popularity over the last few years. From the meager days of Xenogears and Saga, to Xenoblade 1 and X doing okay in sales, to the millions that have sold for 2 and 3. The series is clearly on the up and up, and is one of Nintendo's rising stars in my eyes. And we have reached an impasse. A fork in the road, if you will. Xenoblade 4's potential is as high as it ever could be. The series has never had more eyes on it than it does right now. And Monolith need to stick the landing. And I think there's a few trends in the series that we could look at to get a judge for what Xenoblade 4 may end up like. And where the series can go from here. So buckle up, jabronis. Let's see what the future may have in store for us. Okay, let's just start off with a quick theory. That is technically a theory, but we don't have confirmation, but it's, like, in my eyes, 99% likely. I think Xenoblade 4 is on the next Nintendo console. I think that's the smart play. Get Monolith some more power to work with. They already have amazing visuals. Give them some tech to really gnaw at, and create some beautiful spectacles. I don't think it'll be a launch title, but maybe a couple of years after launch. Now, I think we got a taste of the direction they want to go with in the future with Xenoblade 3. When you look at the base game of 3 and you compare that state of game to Future Redeemed, there's quite a few fundamental different design choices that look weird in a vacuum and almost indecisive, but view them as data points forming a pattern and they fall in line. What do I mean by that? Okay, let's talk. 3 was laid out with a pretty open world. Sure, the world didn't have as many unique or out-there aesthetics as Xenoblade 1 and 2, and even then, that's kind of subjective as to what you personally prefer. But what did 3's world do so differently to 1 and 2? It was way more open in its design. There were these hidden areas all over the place. You had things like quests, containers, husks, secret caves. You know, they had that one rudimentary puzzle where you just rotate things into place. You could find hero quests by doing certain prereqs, or gain new abilities to, to traverse the world differently, like climbing ivy or grinding rails, that give you access to entirely new areas you didn't have access to before. Sure, it was all simple in its individual design, but the world felt increasingly Metroidvania-esque in that regard. That is, if you didn't play Xenoblade X. Because if you did, you knew exactly where they were getting this inspiration from. This is a direct philosophy you will know all too well. In that game, you unlock the skill. Essentially, TLDR, a giant freaking robot. And after a certain point in the story, you unlock your first skill, which lets you run farther, jump higher, and jump farther. Cool. That gives you access to places you couldn't get to before, with just your feet. However, even later on, closer to the end of the game, you unlock flying. And that's when everything, again, changes. At each of those steps, the game itself fundamentally changed how you viewed the world, and how the world gave you access to different areas you couldn't just get to before. So you felt incentivized to re-explore places you already had been to, or those few places you made mental notes of that you wanted to backtrack to to explore. 3 kind of leaned back into that idea. Not all the way, mind you, but it certainly dipped its toe in that direction. Future Redeem tackled that idea in a different manner. See, instead of unlocking abilities to give you access to different places, what you did was you gathered materials to build ladders or ether rails to get to new areas. And if you peel back the layers, it's a different design philosophy. It put the onus on your ability to collect and then invest into going to certain areas of your own prerogative, instead of just being a flat unlock. You picked and chose where you, the player, wanted to go and what you wanted to prioritize. The reward structure also was tackled in a similar manner. It leaned into a more checklist style of approach for things to accomplish. Enemypedia, Collectopedia, Community, etc. There's a bunch of different collectathon tasks that all rewarded you the same with affinity points. Its world was smaller, granted, but it was more packed with things to do, and then it rewarded you by giving you affinity points you could use to build up and flesh out certain characters at your choosing. It leaned more on player agency and giving you the choice as to how to play at each step, whereas 3 was more of a form of linear progression with you unlocking abilities to traverse the world. Granted, its character progression and customization was non-linear in essence, since you could choose what characters to level up for certain classes, etc., but Future Redeemed leaned far more into non-linearity than Base 3 did. It wasn't like 3 where, okay, you got to this section, now these new heroes are available to you. You can go get them if you want, you don't have to. But it's not like you can go for a machine assassin right off the 
back of chapter one. You can't do that. Whereas in Future Redeemed, you got an art slot. Who you want that to go to? You got a new affinity talent pool to unlock. Okay, cool. Who do you want to unlock that on? You chose. It was far more non-linear in its design than three was. Three gave you the feeling that it was non-linear, but when you really look at it, it kind of pushed you down a path in a general sense. Future Redeem doesn't really do that outside of saying, okay, now we're gonna go to Prison Island, etc. In a vacuum, you could view this as just them trying a different style, but dig a bit deeper. And to me, it felt like they were experimenting with which style people gravitated towards more so they can lean more into that specific style or certain aspects of that style. Both games had distinct notes of Xenoblade X gameplay design to them, but they specialized in different aspects of X's formula more than the other to see what stuck. Now look back to Xenoblade 1 and 2, and those games experimented with different styles of visual progression. What do I mean by that? Well, climbing the Bionis and then the Mechonis in Xenoblade 1 allowed you to see the progress you made at dang near every step, just by looking out at the skybox and seeing where you were in relation to the Titan you are on or opposed to. You look up from Earth C and there's just nothing there, you've reached the top, and you felt that. You felt like, oh, this journey has come a long way, hasn't it? Xenoblade 2 centered on the world tree, and so long as you are outside, you could almost always see what your goal was out in the distance, with the world tree looming ever-presently on the horizon. Now look at 3 and Future Redeemed. What did they do? And spoilers for Future Redeemed coming up. 3 leaned more back into Xenoblade 1's form of visual progression with the Orion Titan and Makana Sword, getting larger in your skybox with each zone that you progressed to that was closer to them. The game had a clear, visual, ever-presence in the sky and made it larger or smaller to indicate your progression in the game. It was a key visual and gave you a subconscious or conscious, if you noticed it, feeling of progression throughout the game. What did Future Redeem do? Well, kind of a mix. Prison Island was largely visible throughout most of the game and even at the start, and got way larger as you progressed towards it in Chapter 4. But you also had Origin, which in my opinion was the more key visual here. That once it showed up, looming right over you, it indicated, Hey, I'm right here, I'm your goal. Your goal from now on is to get to me. And it laid more in the World Tree style of world design, where your goal is always right there, and you do things around it. Knowing that Origin is at the center of it all, and your goal is in sight, Origin also leaned into that role in the base game once it showed up as well. Since it was in the middle of the map, but to me the Orion Titan and the Makana Sword were far more of a key visual that stuck with you more because that was the beginning of the game, it was always there. It was just a difference of which one they leaned more into. They all, both of them had some aspects of 1 and 2 in that regard. Just the base game leaned more into Xenoblade 1, while Future Redeemed leaned more into Xenoblade 2. See how they utilized both aspects from Xenoblade 1 and 2 in terms of showing you your goal all the time in Xenoblade 3? I think the gameplay and overall world design for 3 and Future Redeemed is fulfilling a similar role here, and I imagine 4 will consist of some kind of blend of these gameplay and progression features. Personally, I would love to see the Affinity Point system return, Collectopedia and Enemypedia systems also returning, while having worlds and zones as sprawling as 3. I enjoy having those lists of things to do, and always feel like I'm working towards something and gaining access to new forms of progression to round up my characters at a pace and at my own choosing. I really love that design in Future Redeemed. And here's where that initial theory I talked about comes into play. I think and hope that 4 is on the next console for Nintendo, and that's a large step up for power, because I miss those wildly out there and bigger than life world designs from 1 and 2. 3 felt way more tame in comparison, and I don't know if I would chalk it up to power because, well, X was on the Wii U for God's sakes, but Monolith, you give them more power to make a beautiful world and I can only imagine what they could create. But again, whether you prefer that style of visual from 3, or the more, in my opinion, out there and unique and sprawling aesthetics of Xenoblade 1 and 2, that's personal preference. I prefer 1 and 2 personally. But the main point here is simple. We have four Xenoblade games, because while X may not necessarily be canon, its gameplay elements are clearly being borrowed from. Monolith have four mainline games on top of DLC like Torn and Future Redeemed, to take inspiration from gameplay and world design-wise, to take critique from, to pick and choose what worked and what didn't work. I have been an advocate of the following idea for a while now. If Monolith could give me a Xenoblade game, with the story caliber of Xenoblade 1, 2, or 3, with the gameplay and world exploration of Xenoblade X, that game would probably end up being my favorite Xenoblade game that isn't weighed by nostalgia, and Xenoblade 2 is already my second favorite game of all time. 
That, to me, is the formula to aim for. Xenoblade 1, 2, and 3 focus primarily on its story and characters, whereas Xenoblade X exists to propagate its world and gameplay design philosophies, whereas its story and characters take a backseat in comparison. It doesn't mean that either style just ignores what it doesn't focus on, but the majority of the investment and focus is on 1, 2, and 3's story and characters, and 3's gameplay. I mean, X's gameplay, sorry. You combine those two elements together and get them to flow into each other, and that game, to me, is the goal of Xenoblade design. That, to me, is the potential of the series, to just lean into big, larger-than-life set pieces, engrossing character development, beautiful cinematography and sound direction on top of a world you want to explore because the world itself is so captivating and full of interesting things to do and complete, while being paired with character progression and customization that breeds a sense of individuality in your playthrough and lets you develop your game to your styles and prioritize what you enjoy more while still giving you a sense of variety in the game's content offering where you could focus on enemypedia, collectopedia, side, char side characters, side quests, character-driven side quests like Blades of Hero quests, and quests to upgrade and improve your mobility and the way you interface with the world like the scale mechanic for Max. Give me moments like that when I unlocked scales for the first time, or unlocked scale flying, that just feels so liberating and make me appreciate the world design in a fundamentally different way, and feel like I'm Rock Lee just dropping my weights against Gaara. Like, the game has changed. Do all that while giving me moments like Chapter 5 of Xenoblade 3, or Prison Island from 1, or Tantal from 2, or any of the game's endings. Give me amazing characters and storylines to get invested in, to want to care about. Because we know Monolith are capable of doing that. And we know they're capable of doing that better than dang near anyone else in the industry. While also giving me those gameplay memories like in X as well. And the fun customization in Future Redeemed and that great sense of visual progression we got from Xenoblade 3. Combine those elements into one game and that to me is a winning formula. An instant classic. And if executed correctly, easily one of the best games ever made. That, in my opinion, is the limitless potential of Xenoblade Chronicles. So thank you all for tuning in. My pleasure making the video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out and helps support future content, and I greatly appreciate it. Stay safe, everybody. Have a great day. Go play some video games if you can. And as always, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye, everybody, until we meet again.